had been over a year since graduation, and the plan to reunite with my best friends from college for a camping adventure in the St. Francis National Forest was finally unfolding. The excitement was building as we gathered at a motel a few miles away the night before our trek. The reunion was a whirlwind of laughter, catching up in shared anticipation for the adventure ahead. Early the next morning, we stopped at a gas station to grab some last-minute supplies. An older man, maybe in his late fifties, early sixties, was perched on a wooden crate at the entrance, brazenly just staring at us as we approached. We picked up all the things we needed, and the lady at the cash desk wished us good luck with our trip. As we left the store, the strange old man still sitting outside muttered as we passed, Where are you heading, girls? We said nothing and pretended like we didn't hear, brushing it off as typical gas station weirdness and continued on our way. I guess we were determined not to get caught up in anything that could take up valuable time on our trip, especially pointless exchanges with strange gas station characters. The day's hike through the dense woods was nothing short of amazing. We marveled at the wildlife, reminiscing about college days, and by late afternoon, stumbled upon a breathtaking clearing overlooking the forested hills. It seemed like the perfect spot to camp for the night and we quickly had the huge tent set up with more than enough room for the four of us. We made a small campfire and huddled round, laughing and sharing stories from our time apart. As the temperature began to drop and tiredness began to take hold, we called it a night, planning for an early rise. Sometime later, in the quiet of the night, I was gently nudged awake by my friend Emma. Her finger pressed to her lips in a shush gesture. The others were already awake, sitting in tense silence. Through the sounds of the crickets outside, I could barely make out the rustling grass and whispered voices nearby. My mind immediately raced back to the gas station encounter with that strange old guy, and I whispered my suspicion to the others. Wide-eyed, frozen with panic, we listened to the noises getting closer to the tent. With an unexpected flash of courage, I grabbed my flashlight, unzipped the tent and peered outside. The moonlight revealed a group of young men, maybe in their early twenties, standing a few meters away. I felt a slight relief for a moment, until one of them chuckled, Oh, sorry if we scared you. Laughter erupted from the group, and I felt a cold rush of fear. One of the strangers started explaining, in a kind of sarcastic tone, that they were already camping there, accusing us of pitching up on their site without permission. My friends climbed out the tent as we tried to reason with them, apologizing for the supposed misunderstanding to try and avoid any confrontation. The guy paused for a few seconds before shouting out not to worry and that we should all come back to their campsite for some drinks to put all this behind us. As far as I was concerned, there was nothing to put behind us. We were sleeping a few moments ago and there was no way we were going anywhere with these guys. As politely as possible, we declined their invitation making the excuse that we're all set for an early start in the morning. The leader of the group's face turned very serious looking, as he turned to his friends to say, That's not very polite, is it? We're here trying to be welcoming. He began to walk towards us, his friends following suit, as a huge argument broke out between us all. The group closed in, encircling the front of our tent, when apparently out of nowhere, Our shouting match was halted by the sound of a dog barking close by as the scene was suddenly illuminated by two blinding flashlight beams. Two men and the barking dog emerged from the nearby embankment and to my utter disbelief, it was the strange old man from the gas station accompanied by an almost identical looking companion who appeared to be carrying a hunting rifle. Boys, you better step back from that tent one of them shouted at the group. The old man walked over to us casually, asking if we were okay, as his passenger backed the group of guys away, rifle trained on them as they stepped backwards away from our campsite. 
As we tried to recall our encounter to the old man, he told us they'd been watching the group of guys through the forest trails, suspicious of jock kids looking to make trouble. A few meters away we could hear the man's friend shouting at the group of guys as they ran off into the woods. They won't be back to bother you, I can assure you, the man said laughing to himself as he walked back over to join us. Wide awake and immensely grateful, we spent the next couple of hours chatting with our unexpected saviours. They shared coffee and tales of their experiences growing up and working in the area. Eventually, as dawn approached, we bid them farewell and crashed out for a couple of hours, exhausted from the drama and lack of sleep. The following day, determined not to let the encounter dampen our spirits, we tried to push on with the trekking, but I could tell the silent tension was affecting us all. We opted to return to town for the evening, spending our last night together drinking and dancing, seeking the safety of lights and company in a public place. We still meet up every year, and maybe have an even stronger bond now between us all. We've been on a few camping trips since, and that night's sudden terror of being in danger in such an isolated place was definitely a lesson learned for all of us. A few years ago, during my annual vacation to visit my mum near Canmore in Alberta, I decided to fit in a solo hike. My grandpa was my usual travel buddy on these yearly trips, but this year he was busy, so I was on my own. The countryside was breathtaking as always, and the warm August day seemed perfect for an adventure. I set off early, taking in the sounds of nature and the crisp clean air. As I hiked through the trails, a rustle behind me caught my attention. I stopped to try and tune into it, but eventually dismissed it as one of the many woodland sounds and just kept walking. As the day progressed, I was sure I could hear a similar sound again, not getting louder per se, but maybe just growing more noticeable to me. As I turned a bend, trying to decide to myself if I was just being paranoid, I looked up the rocky verge toward the tree line and froze. I had that really strong feeling like when you know you're being watched, but I couldn't see anything moving. I stared between the layers of branches and overgrowth for a minute before my eyes focused. There, staring directly at me, was the partially camouflaged head of a cougar in the trees, silently observing, apparently having tracked me all day. I instantly panicked and started to shout and throw any rocks I could find, but the cougar barely flinched, remaining fixated. I had bear spray in my rucksack, but the cougar was too far away at this point for it to be effective. Suddenly, the cougar lowered its head and body and began advancing slowly. Frantically, I pulled at my bag for the bear spray and grabbed a thick broken branch from the ground beside me keeping my eyes fixed on the cougar the whole time. As it neared within range, my heart pounding so hard I could barely hear, I unleashed a jet of bear spray and struck the cougar hard on the head with the branch. The animal hissed, showing its massive teeth as it retreated, shaking its head as it went. I sat down and took a few minutes to get myself together after watching the animal disappear into the trees. Shaken, but still somehow keen to continue my trek. I pressed on with heightened caution, staying out in the open and avoiding areas of cover as much as possible. A few kilometers up the trail, I passed a group setting up camp and warned them about the encounter. As daylight faded, I walked for another 40 minutes or so and chose an open rocky area for my campsite, far from potential hiding spots. I built a large campfire near my tent which was so comforting as I relaxed under the stars, shaking off the tension from the day's unexpected events. The night remained calm, and the hypnotic effect of the heat and flames made my eyelids start to feel heavy. I stocked up the fire and settled into my tent. What felt like a few hours later, I awoke to the sounds of movement outside. At first I could just hear the heavy breathing and huffing of an animal, then something brushed along the side of my tent. 
Convinced the cougar must have still been tracking me, I moved to the front of the tent, nearest to the faint glow of the fading campfire, and began to clap and shout at the top of my voice. The noises outside seemed to subside, and I waited a couple of minutes and then exited the tent, scanning around with my flashlight. With the coast seemingly clear, I restocked the campfire and sat by the roaring flames until sunrise. As dawn approached an hour or so later, I packed up, finally succumbing to the obvious danger and deciding to cut the trip short and head back to my mum's house. Kneeling down to stuff the last of the tent into my bag, I heard a frantic noise behind me, accompanied by a chilling growl. Before I could react, the cougar appeared and charged from behind, its claws digging into the back of my head. I screamed as I felt it trying to clamp its jaws down onto my shoulder. Totally unable to get my bearings or focus, I reached out for a tent pole and began hitting the cougar as hard as I could. It released its grip momentarily, allowing me to move from underneath it. With several hard swings of the metal tent pole connecting, the cougar yelped and hissed as it ran off. I stood there frozen, clenching the tent pole until I noticed the blood gushing down my arm. As I collapsed to the ground, through the ringing in my ears, I could hear the sound of voices nearby, and seconds later, a family passing on mountain bikes stopped one by one, discovering me in a bloodied heap. The family called for an ambulance and carried me down the trail to the cabins where I could gain access. In and out of consciousness, I ended up with about 30 stitches in my head and shoulder and the night in the hospital. Even though I know the cougar was clearly trying to rip me to pieces and that I had to do something, I still feel this weird guilt for having to defend myself so violently. But since that trip, I always have the best spray to hand and have never ventured solo into the wilderness again. This happened about five or six years back, when my wife and I decided to take our two daughters, still in their early teens, on a weekend camping trip into the hills. We drove for miles without seeing another soul, the wilderness surrounding us, until randomly we spotted a truck pulled over at the side of the road. We slowed down to check if the driver maybe needed assistance, but as we got near, it looked like the truck was abandoned. There was nobody around that we could see, and thinking nothing of it, we continued our journey, weaving through the winding roads until we found a fenced off area to park the car. We set off on the overgrown trail. The area I had marked on the map for our campsite was a good couple of hours away from the road, a decent trek through the thick forest. We reached the spot just in time to set up our tent under the remaining daylight and watched as the sunset coloured the sky dipping below the tree line. The kids were ecstatic, and we spent the evening around a crackling campfire, toasting marshmallows under the stars. Our laughter echoed in the wilderness, as we enjoyed the simplicity of just being together as a family, out there in nature. Suddenly, we all turned at the same time, as the snap of a branch rang out into a hush that followed. We all looked at each other, half curious, half suspicious, kind of acknowledging that something was unusual amongst the background sound of the wilderness. We paused for a moment, and sure enough, a few seconds later, the sounds of twigs snapping. At this stage, I was fully expecting an animal to appear, but as we sat in silence watching, a man emerged from the shadows and began walking confidently towards us. I stood up, Stepping in front of my family, as the man waved with a weird, forced-looking smile on his face. Hey folks, sorry to bother you, but I've got car trouble down the road there. Would you mind helping me out? It's not far. I explained that our car was parked hours away, and I couldn't leave my wife and kids alone in the wilderness. The man's friendly facade cracked, and he asked again, but kind of aggressively this time anger simmering beneath his forced politeness. I apologised, but told him very firmly that he was going to have to find help elsewhere. With a disappointed expression, 
he begrudgingly muttered his thanks and walked away, back through the trees. The evening continued without incident, and I deliberately played the strange meeting down so that the kids didn't feel scared, but the man and his bullshit story played on my mind. What was he doing out here, seeking help in the middle of nowhere? It was definitely sus, and I didn't believe his story at all. The nagging feeling intensified, and my wife and I talked about it for a while, after the kids had headed into the tent. I'll join you in a bit, I reassured her, pulling one of the chairs into the tree line behind the tent. Still feeling on edge, I sat there in the shadows, watching over my family in the fading campfire, with the case for my registered firearm nearby in my rucksack. Around half an hour later, my suspicions were validated. The sound of rustling leaves betrayed the man's return, as he appeared cautiously from the trees, eyes scanning the campsite. I couldn't believe it. Even though I clearly thought the guy was up to something, part of me assumed I was just being paranoid. But there he was, heading straight for our tent. As he got a little closer, crouching low as if trying to be inconspicuous, I stood up out of my chair, trying to ignore my pounding heartbeat. I shoved the clip into my handgun deliberately hard so that he could hear it and walked toward him. Can I help you with something? I demanded. The man, looking startled, raised his hands, stuttering as he attempted to explain his situation. A heated exchange ensued as I kept the gun pointed at him, my wife scrambling to get a decent signal to call the police. I marched the man to a spot a few yards away from our tent and the kids, my wife doing her best to keep them distracted from the gravity of the situation. After almost two tense hours, the headlights of a police car and a park ranger's vehicle cut through the darkness on a back road trail behind the trees. As the ranger checked on my family, making sure nobody was hurt, the police officer showed zero interest in listening to the man protesting his innocence as he handcuffed him and threw him roughly into the back of his car. With the intruder secured, the ranger and the police officer stopped and talked with us for 10-15 minutes, doing their best to put our minds at ease. They really helped to diffuse the tension, and even offered to give us a lift back to our car if we were considering calling off the rest of our trip. We discussed with the kids to see what they wanted to do, but in the end we all decided to turn the experience into a positive one. And the next day, we continued our trip, determined to make the most of our time in the great outdoors. We explored and reveled in the beauty around us, shielding our kids from the unsettling truth of how close they had come to danger. <laughs>